Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm uh, Olivia, and I'm an executive chef here, uh, mostly hanging out at Oasis Cafe. Wait, save your applause for this guy. OK. So um, I am thrilled. I think most of us here are thrilled to, to have um, David Chang here as uh, our guest and our speaker. Um, he is, of course, the chef who opened Momofuku in New York and then followed with Sam, Ko, Milk. Um, I haven't asked him yet, but I think he, he had a, a, a reaction to a four-syllable restaurant, and then so the next three are one-syllable names for his restaurants. Um, um, all really good and catchy and bold, which is the kind of person uh, David is and the kind of cuisine that he does. In a lot of ways, I feel like um, we've all been waiting for David. Uh, I have been. Um, you know, we went through decades of fusion and then post-fusion, and all of these cuisines, some of which was very good, but a lot of which I thought were more like um, the people I know, Americans I know who go overseas um, for two weeks and bring back tchotchkes uh, and uh, maybe a Buddha head, which they spend a lot of money on, and they put it in their living rooms. I I've, I've felt so often I was eating off plates that were um, full of tchotchkes of a two-week trip that an American chef took overseas. Um, and I will follow that with a story uh, that I tell about when I was in the San Francisco Chronicle as a writer, uh, mostly in, in the food and wine sections. And um, we, we run through a lot of recipes. We test them. Uh, and we, uh, there are a lot of good recipes. But um, once, and, and I consider my colleagues at the Chronicle to be literate, progressive, educated, open people. Uh, very open to diversity, but when I think a local, I forget, Filipino or um, Japanese chef sent in his recipe for spaghetti with meat sauce, the reaction of my colleagues was, what is he doing with spaghetti and meat sauce? So, and that really um, disappointed me deeply because it's okay for you to do fusion if you go to the east and pluck from there. It's not okay for somebody who's not uh, Western to try to do his version of your dish. And so it's, for me, it's never been a two-way street and a real expression of diversity. And, and what we've waited for is somebody who's here today, David. So um, he's somebody who, for me, um, follows what I think is a maxim of art. You know, as a writer, where I'm told other writers say, write what you know about. And for me, it carries into what I cook. Cook what I know. Cook from the flavors of my past. Um, so that what I do is a full expression of the totality of, of who I am, past and, and new experiences. And I think this is what David does so beautifully. Um, his recipes in the book are down to earth, real, bold, and, and I've seen him say and write, you know, um, so many times that I'm just trying to do the best food that I can. And I think it's also very um, instructive to know that when I asked David what, what were his favorite restaurants to go to when he comes to the Bay Area, he says he likes to hang out in the Mission and go to all the taquerias. <laughs> so um, I totally get that. And I, I, I totally love that food myself. And I think it's one of the best expressions of of what's happening in America with American food. So um, I think you'll find he is really down to earth, really honest, um, and, and his f um, flavors and plates and bowls speak to that. Um, my, my first introduction to David was the article I read about him in the New Yorker. Anybody read about him? Where, where it seemed like every time you were quoted, there was an F word. Yeah, you did, you did. Um, but but it, it really is how real he is, and, and despite the cult following that he now has and, and all the fame that he's garnered, um, he's just really himself. And I'm very, very happy to introduce you to him.
How are you guys doing? Um, this is pretty cool going on. I had no idea that I'd be one day cooking would lead me to Google and speaking in front of people on the Google campus. Um, brought Peter Meehan and dude from McSweeney's. <laughs> but um, I was supposed to prepare something today, but as usual, I didn't prepare anything, which is why I would never get a job at Google because they would never hire me because I did terrible at, I wasn't very good at anything until I sort of got into cooking. And when I started to cook, I didn't think that I would ever be as good as the chefs that I worked for. And, um, you know, I guess, I guess a lot of it was sort of because I played a, comp a lot of competitive golf as a kid. And, and when you're playing golf, it's you against the golf course and the scoreboard. So it was always checking the competition. I'm always looking at how can I beat everybody? I have to, I have to shoot such and such. Uh, so whatever round. And uh, I think that's carried over into you know, the cooking career. And long story cut short, I uh, got out of the fine dining world because I realized that I was, I always say this and a lot, and it's true, I, I didn't, nor did I think that I was going to be better than the chefs that I was working for, whether that be chefs like Danielle Balud or, or Thomas Keller or whatnot. I just didn't think I could ever attain that level. So um, the goal was just to open up a restaurant. And that was it. I, I sort of got out of it, and we had my, my mother was going through cancer. There was a lot of family things going on, and I think um, I wish I had a better game plan in terms of what, what happened after we opened the restaurant, but I, I don't think anyone in their right mind would have opened a restaurant in the East Village, 2004, that's 600 square feet. Um, and when we opened up, we didn't even know if we had enough room for chairs. Um, we thought it might have to be standing room only. And um, I lived up. I lived literally above, above the restaurant, and um, that was that. And I, I never thought anything other than that. Let's just try to stay in business a year, uh, pay back the almost two hundred thousand dollars it took to open up that restaurant, and it was really just a test to myself. And um, one thing led to another, another, and what, what's sort of become a maxim at our restaurant is to make mistakes to 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 if you're going to fuck up you know do go go big you know <laughs> <laughs> and um no one's made more mistakes than myself and i think that's how we've grown and that's shaped our cooking philosophy that's shaped how we treat our employees and it's how um it started off really as one Myself and uh, Joaquin Bach, he, he's recently opened a restaurant in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Star. Um, it was just two of us. And nobody believed in us. Nobody thought that anything would ever happen. And uh, we were just going to be a statistic. We were going to be another restaurant that was going to go out of business in under a year, which is something like 99% of all restaurants. Um, and um, somehow we caught, li uh, we caught lightning in a bottle and... Um, our food got better. We were on the verge of going out of business, very much. Um, you know, it was hard to learn how to run a business. It, it's hard to hard enough to cook, but to learn how to run a cash register, learn how to um, be a manager too. That was a very difficult process, and it still is a difficult process to learn how to do. Um, but we made every mistake you could ever make, opening up those first few months. Um, and then, and then people started to trickle in. Um, but before that happened, we, it, was, it was sort of a watershed moment. It was really like, you know, we're going to cook whatever we want to cook. We're going to go out of business. Let's just really go out of business. Let's, let's <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Who cares, you know? People around the world do not care about us. They don't, no one in the city cares about us right now. So let's just try to do something that is, uh, honest and, and integrity, uh, full of integrity, and that's sort of when we started to learn not to cook for the customer. Um, you know, the, 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 the maxim that the customer is always right, that doesn't apply to our restaurants. And that's sort of the beginning of the Momofuku culture and how we've started to run things. It's a, usually the customer is always wrong. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the one, the places that where the customers are always right, they take the shotgun approach, and they're the TGI Fridays, the Cheesecake Factories, and you know, they're there. But that's not what we wanted to be. And we're in New York, and there's a lot of variety. So we wanted to uh, add to that variety and that eclectic mix. Um, so that re that led to Sambar. Um, noodle Bar became a success. I don't know how, still, when I look back on it. Um, <laughs> in Sambar, I had this great idea because I was, I was, um, I became friends with Steve Ells. He's the founder of Chipotle. And uh, I was inspired to do an, a Mexican Asian like burrito bar. And um, we did it. We actually made it and on the corner of 13th Street and 2nd Avenue. And I think in, the annals of New York City restaurant history it might go down as one of the biggest failures of all time. Um, and I was almost relieved. I think um, I, we wanted it to happen because we won a lot of awards and I was struggling with the process of, of um, you know, you guys all work for Google, you guys probably did well in school and, and all that stuff. I was never that person. When you start out cooking, or at least when I did, it was because it was something I was honest. It was something that I could get better at, and uh, I could get, I could be mentored by people. Um, and now it's it's a it's a very different different food culture. Um, but going back to Sambar, I uh, we had won we had won these awards, and I think subconsciously I wanted us to fail so we could get back to cooking, uh, not for the critics, and get away from the spotlight. Um, because in New York it's pretty intense, and right now it's pretty intense. Um, but through that failure, and I don't even have, I don't really want, we don't have to go into the the problems of Sambar, but um, if we never had that terrible idea, we wouldn't I wouldn't be here today speaking to you. And that's why I always encourage people to make mistakes um, and to analyze them and to be your harshest critic. Um, it was a really bad idea, but then. Once you make that decision, it opens up doorways and new variables that you would not have access to are suddenly available to you. So we opened up late night to make ends meet. And then that late night menu became the full-time menu. Then Sambar became just a regular restaurant. And then we renovated it, got rid of the last, uh, we got rid of the burrito bar concept completely. And next thing you know, we're reviewed by the New York Times. We get two stars, and then we get three stars. Um, and it's probably the most hated restaurant, I think, in New York City. If I worked at another three-star restaurant and I saw that Momofuku Sambar got three stars, I would be upset. <laughs> uh, because it, it, um, we have paper towels. We don't even have paper towels. We have disposal chopsticks. We have f flooring as our decor, a big picture of John McEnroe. And that's about it, Dis and disposable napkins. And it didn't really um, follow the genre of what a three-star restaurant in New York City uh, was about. And then came the crazy thing, like restaurant top 50. Uh, Sambar was named the 31st best restaurant in the world. And you know that's a very subjective thing by voters and whatnot, but it was... Um, it, it, it really made things surreal. And everything has progressively became more, more, more surreal and absurd, but uh, that's how that happened. And then, you know, over the past five and a half years, we moved Noodle Bar to a bigger location. Uh, so we have five, we're gonna have five restaurants. We're opening up in Midtown. And then Co was the, where, was where um, the original Noodle Bar was at. And, I think it was our most ambitious project, uh, and ambitious not in size, but in terms of, um, I guess, trying to say fuck you to everybody. Uh, and and I, I have no other, no other way to describe that, because um, there were a lot of people that were doubting us, doubting our ability uh, at Noodle Bar, at Sambar, doubting myself. I was doubting myself. And we were going to open up a 12-seat restaurant. And we had to because of the, um, you know, a lot of there were as if you haven't noticed, I don't really follow an outline. I don't follow a game plan. And usually how things worked for us was 
uh, out of necessity. And that the 27 seat restaurant that was the original noodle bar was doing 300, 350 covers a day. We were doing over $4 million in sales out of a 600 square foot shop. Um, we, were, we were doing incredibly well. And um, one of the things that allowed us to make the decisions that we continue to do is that um, we didn't have any investors. So we were allowed to um, dwell on our mistakes. You know, it's, it's sort of um, the one thing I learned in college was I, I did study a lot of religion and uh, Kaizen. It was uh, the whole concept of getting better every day. And um, um, Ko was um, Ko was an example of that. And it was a uh, it's a place where well we, it's 12 seats. We don't need a reservationist. Um, we can't do 300 covers because the place was literally falling apart, and we don't have enough money to really renovate it. So, what would be the biggest and most radical thing we could do um, in terms of food? And for me at that time, I was really, and I still think one of the coolest things that can ever happen food wise, besides actually manipulating the food, is serving great food. Like the best food, imagine the best food in the world you've ever had coming out of a truck, a food truck, or a little hole in the wall. Like, why does it have to stop? Why do people have to set their standards uh, to the environment they're in? So what we've done at Momofuku and what I'm constantly trying to push upon people is let's have the highest standards possible. Let us, let's, uh, like I always say, like, why not us? Why can't we have the best food in the world? We can aspire to be that. Why can't we have the best service in the world? Even though people don't expect it, we want people to leave being like, fuck, that was amazing. I can't believe that happened. If, if that doesn't happen, you know, we fail. And, but it's really important that all of our employees get that notion that, um, and it's hard for cooks because, you know, they're allergic to anything corporate or any type of message unless they're getting yelled at. So um, back to Co, 12-seat um, restaurant and um, no menu. We're just going to serve you food three cooks, and it was a way to pay the cooks more money. Um, it sort of bothers me that I'm, I'm very happy that servers get paid as what they do, but it bothers me that cooks don't get part, um, they're not allowed to in New York or probably in the rest of America, uh, part of the tip pool. So uh, Co was um, born out of that process a little bit. If the cooks served the food, we were allowed to legally pay them from the tip pool. So. Cooks, are, cooks at Co. make a lot of money for line cooks. And um, we do 24 covers a night. And we receive three stars in the New York Times. And I'm still blown away by this. And the pressure of it really is intense. Because as a chef, and one that really respects French culture, the Michelin Guide gave us two, two Michelin stars for Co. And it's something that. Um, it was a team effort, and it always is, but um, it was very difficult. And it still is difficult to sort of uh, be like, OK, we have two stars. Like, what do we do? Like, how do you improve? Or if you lose it, like, you know, what, what, it's the worst feeling in the world. So um, you know, that's sort of what happened. And uh, we opened up Milk Bar, and we just, things just, it was, it was a snowball effect. And all these things happened. and. We sort of stay true to our philosophy of just trying to do things the right way. And I say, I define integrity, at least when I hire cooks. You know, you can make a dish, and there's a thousand different ways you can go about doing that. And, but if you, chose, if you choose to do it the right way, it's usually the longest and the hardest way. And integrity to me, at least in the kitchen, is when nobody's looking, nobody really cares what you're doing, and you're working on your project, and you're creating mise en place, and that's basically, um, you're prepping out food. And say you're prepping out a dish, and you're taking, nobody notices. But you take the, law, the, the road that is the most difficult, because you know it's the right way. Even though the end product, if you take a shortcut, it would not be noticeable. That's integrity to me. When somebody chooses to do that, and they're not going to get a pat on the back. And uh, we try to instill that in our cooks, and we try to instill that in all of our restaurants. So. Um, you know, that's how Milk Bar opened up. Everything happened by accident. We had a, a, 
a really bad landlord and uh, threatened to put in a new restaurant and that would have messed up some bar. So we took the space and uh, we have an incredibly talented pastry chef named Christina Tosi. And I just sort of let her do whatever she wanted to do. And if you ever come by New York and you're in need of sugar fix, um, yeah, be careful. There, it's a highly addictive stuff. And um, things have moved on, and all these projects have happened. And I'm sort of glad that we signed a deal in Las Vegas and it fell through. Um, well, the, the hotel is ever, not going to ever probably happen. Um, and we signed a deal to do a restaurant in Midtown. And I never thought we'd open a restaurant in Midtown. It's going to be called Ma Pesh, and it's going to be French Vietnamese. And I feel like uh, my good friend Tin Ho, I've worked with for a long time, ever since Cafe Balud, uh, who's incredibly talented. Uh, it's too hard in New York right now for a young chef um, to open up a restaurant. It's too cost prohibitive. They, we are in the lucky, we're fortunate enough to provide opportunities. So I feel like, like everything's been done. Like my original goal was just to open up that restaurant. And everything else has been gravy ever since. So um, if I can help facilitate um, the goals and dreams of my friends, then that's all the better. And that's sort of what we're working on in Midtown. And it's a new project. And um, uh, I guess that's sort of what Pete document helped Pete help document in the book. Um, yeah. But the funny thing is people are like, why, why would you want to document everything? Um, I have this uh, this this uh, this sense of doom every day. I feel like everything is going to fall apart. And I I told Pete I was like, well, things are going pretty well right now, but I don't know if we'll be in business next year. So let's just document this and see what happens, and let it ride. So that's sort of how it happened, and it stopped sort of March two thousand eight, and. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened since then, and, and we're here now. So um, I never, ever would have thought that I'd be at Google campus talking to a bunch of Google employees and realize it's a very small world. I, I've, I've met several people here that um, I, I have some funny stories to share. I can't share with you guys with, but um, it's been a, it's been a, a very strange trip. It's been very, I've been very lucky. Um, but at the end of the day, it's been about focusing on mistakes and having the courage to just go for it, you know. Because I always say you're going to be dead. No one's going to care what you do. And, um, you know, I don't, I mean, I think when you're young enough and if you don't have responsibilities like, like supporting a family or, or children or, or wife, uh, you should be as selfish as possible and um, and go for broke, and that's sort of how we've um, approached our food, how we look at our food, and how we've grown our business. And that's something that is actually fearful for me because uh, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to continue that approach as we get bigger. Now we have, you know, we had no employees. I couldn't get anyone to hire. I couldn't hire anybody. Nobody wanted to work with me. Um, and now we're going to have over 300 employees. So um, things have changed a dramatic, dramatic amount for me, and uh, and just learning how to deal with it. So and just trying to stay as grounded and humble as possible because all this stuff can really screw with your head. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you have some questions, you And so we are live with questions on the Q&A mic. Oh, by the way, you guys should know that like, in the cooking community, it's a big joke. Like, We should have done better in school. We could get a job at Google. So, <laughs> 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 Cooking is not that glamorous. It's, it's, not that, it's fun, but like, you know, there are certain points where you're like, man, I really fucked up. <laughs>
I guess I'll, I'll start it off with a, a, an, an easy question. My, um, my friend um, Grace is a food blogger in New York City. She wanted to know if um, your parents had to go through the online reservation system when they ate at Co. And if they, you could they expand did. on that. They did. They had, their, they had their opportunity at friends and family. And um, it's really important to me that managers, uh, myself included, sous chefs, chef de cuisines, these are all a variety of you know, management levels hold themselves to a higher standard. I never want them to be in a position where they can take from the employees. I never want them to be in a position where they can be morally compromised. Um, so we have, for the restaurant industry, I think, ridiculously high standards for, for how things are done. And I think that um, had I uh, uh, cheated the system for my parents, it wouldn't have set a good example. So if my parents have to do it, then everyone else has to do it. So. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming. I think I speak for everybody. Um, my question is, would you ever consider opening a restaurant in San Francisco? <laughs> Love Mission Burritos, but I, frankly, I'm kind of sick of eating figs on a plate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got in a lot of heat for a lot of trouble for recent <laughs> comments, but I stand by that. Um, you know, it was a generalization. I'm learning, you know, what I say actually gets out in the public, which is a totally <laughs> weird concept. <laughs> But um, when I said that, and we spoke about it last night at, um, uh, with a couple other chefs, uh, and I don't know if I'd open up a restaurant in San Francisco as much as I'd like to. I don't know um, if that would happen. I'd like to open up something because of the produce. I think San Francisco I, and California, even LA, uh, arguably has the best produce in the world. And... Uh, you know, maybe I didn't articulate it well enough, and that was probably what happened. <laughs> um, but I just feel that I love I love Alice Waters. I love what Shea Panisse has done. I love the offshoots of it. Um, and Alice is like my mom. I have these mother figures in my life, and she's one of them. So it's really important. And I know that her and Tony don't get along, so it puts me in an awkward position. Um, but uh, she. She provides the, the idea of the utopian concept, and it's very important that she exists and she pushes her vision. Um, but at the same time, it's been uh, the success of Chez Panisse, the success of Olivetto, Zuni Cafe, and a lot of those restaurants um, have been so, so strong that I think that it's killed any other creativity. Uh, and I just think it's uh, the Bay Area almost outside of the French Laundry and a, few, a handful of restaurants, um, you know, it just promotes the status quo in terms of what food is. And I think that as a city and as an area that is as culturally diverse, ethnically diverse, I think the food should be representative of that. And that's what I went by, you know, every restaurant sort of serving figs on a plate. Obviously, that's generalization. It rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Um, I didn't mean to offend anybody, but <laughs> it was more like, hey, you guys have awesome stuff. It's great. We have, you guys have enough restaurants that are cooking with that philosophy that, of purity, and it's important that those restaurants exist. Chez Panisse, Olivetto, these are some of my favorite restaurants. But why does every restaurant have to sort of be in that family tree? And I think that if you don't encourage young talent, and if this city doesn't encourage progressive cooking, and progressive doesn't have to be modern culinary, uh, you know, pushing the envelope, it can be simple as well. Um, just a variety of different things. And, and that's what I was trying to say. I love San Francisco, I love the Bay Area, and I just, I just, I wanted to have, just like I want America, I just think that America, New York in general, we can always strive to do better. And that's all I was saying, so. Hi, David. Hello. In your talk, you mentioned a lot about focusing on mistakes. Mm. Can you talk about some of the culinary mistakes that you or your chefs have made that wow. would make interesting stories? Um, I'll, I can think of right, right off the top of my head, I was so bad in cooking school that my partner quit cooking school. <laughs> yeah, 
It's a true story. She, uh, she owns a restaurant and in New York, and um, she decided to go to culinary school. And um, yeah, she was, she was like, I refuse to. She found out that I was going to be her level two partner. And um, she said she would rather quit than be my partner. So <laughs> that's how bad I was as a cook. And that's the one thing about cooking. And I have this, I have this guy, he, he's actually from Berkeley. And um, I told my guys at Sambar that this guy, he was a kumi at Co. And he makes blunder after blunder after blunder. And, and maybe I see a little of myself in him, but he's just got this... Um, stubbornness about him where he's just gonna work and work till he gets it right is he the fastest cook no is he the best cook i've ever seen no um but it is that sort of doggedness and this determination to get it right where i told everyone i was like i would rather have like 10 cooks like this guy than than have like five superstar cooks because i think building a cook Building a team around people like that is how you build a company, and particularly how you start a, a, a restaurant. And um, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen every mistake, I think, under the sun. Um, so, yeah, I, I've made a lot of them. Uh, unfortunately, I've, fortunately for me, I've um, not, I've, I haven't been on the receiving end of a lot of them, like missing, missing fingers and digits and stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Um, you mentioned that in the beginning you just really wanted to open one restaurant and it was you and another person actually doing the cooking. Now that you have like multiple restaurants open, what percent of your time would you say you spend managing the book of business and like the different the 300 people underneath like working for you and um, what percent of the time would you say you spend actually like in the kitchen and working yeah. on new dishes? Um, that's a very, very, I mean, that question is uh, something I ask myself every day. Um, I don't spend that much time in the kitchen anymore, and that's something that's very difficult. Um, because when you're a cook, you have, you, you come in the mornings or afternoon, you get a piece of paper, and there's another piece of paper from your nighttime partner, and you, it, you write a mise en place list. And you, your goal is just to prep out, cross stuff off until dinner service starts. And then you work service, you have a good service or you bad service, but you, you, f you feel completed because that was your day. And that's how you could define yourself. Um, and that's still how I feel about work. Um, one of the reasons why I enjoy cooking so much is because it was actually, for me, I could quantify a good day of work. Um, now, um, for many reasons, I'm not in the kitchen. I'm not cooking. Uh, for instance, like Co, um, I really shouldn't be in the hospitality business because I'm not that uh, friendly to guests, I guess. Um, but uh, it's also because we have open kitchens and it's just too much. Um, and my, my time would be better spent um, observing behind the scenes and, and teaching the cooks or uh, before service starts. Um, and um, you know, becoming a manager is probably taking up most of my time these days. Um, I have to cook occasionally, but um, I thought that I'd be able to sort of come up with dishes, uh, theoretically speaking, and it's just that that isn't happening. You need to work with the product, at least for me. And, um, you know, I was telling Pete, hopefully by the summer I'll be able to get back into the kitchen. But part of it is I, I have this weird thing about creativity. I just think that for me as a cook, uh, like, I just think that you hit a point where you're not, you're not going to get better. Um, you know, Cooking is one of those industries or at least fields where I just don't think you get better as you get older. Uh, ideas don't come to you freely. Obviously, that's not the case for everyone. But for myself, you just get bogged down with other stuff. So... You know, whether it's opening another restaurant or say I have a family down the road, my energies are going to be elsewhere other than thinking about food. And for, for five years straight, it was pretty much only food, and I could just focus on that. And, and I was really supported by a, an incredible team. And it's really not just me. I mean, I am really blessed to have um, 
an amazing staff. I, I think we have one of the best crews in, in New York City. So, and I still don't know how and why they are still working with me, but it, I'm lucky for that. Hi. Hi. So uh, I was working in a three-star restaurant in New York when some got its three stars in the New York Times. And uh, I don't think we were pissed, but we were kind of like, what? Um, so well, you were like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess it was like a what the fuck kind of thing. But um, I think what you, what you said in the beginning was that the customers are always wrong. And the philosophy that I was taught when I come from is customers are always right and then some. But you've got two Michelin stars at Co. So obviously you guys are doing something right. And I'd just love to hear more well, about your customer service philosophy. That's the thing. It's like I, I like looking at things in an obviously a different way when people say it's a bad idea or something is a cliche or something is just not working I like to analyze it because uh, people aren't looking at it and I think that there might be something more to it um, I'll give you a perfect example and um, you know Daniel Daniel Hum he's the chef at 11 Madison Park at the old noodle bar customer was complaining about pork belly in our pork buns and I've served enough pork belly, I know pork belly, I know exactly what it should look like, and I, we served him, and Daniel was actually right next to him, and he was laughing his ass off, but he was like, I, 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 this isn't pork belly, there's too much fat in it. I'm just like, <laughs> he wanted a refund and he wanted new pork buns, and I was just like, I'm sorry, no. I mean, this is what you ordered, this is actually, you know, has less fat content than most pork belly, so, um, and he was going on and on and on how much he knew about pork belly. So I was like, just shut the, I'm basically like, shut the fuck up. You're not that bad. <laughs> um, and, you know, most restaurants would obviously go the other way. Uh, it worked for us uh, at that time. I don't know if it, con it will continue to work for us. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when we make mistakes, like if we're going to make a mistake, I want us to be aware of it and I want us to be two steps ahead of that. So hopefully we're not, we're not making mistakes. But if we do make a mistake, uh, like if we overcook a piece of fish and, you know, it's objectively proven that we fucked up, you know, whether it be on the service end or uh, the creation of the dish, um, we'll go out of our way to make that person, um, we'll go out of our way to make it right. So, um, yeah, customer's not always right. I mean, that's the thing. It's like these, these maxims, these... These platitudes, they're like, you know, why, why can't they be challenged? So, you know, like I had to attend this stupid corporate thing because we're getting bigger. And <laughs> I never thought that we'd attend, like have like management coaches. And I called them like the Bob and Bob's from office space. And they were like, you don't have a mission statement. I was like, why do we need a mission statement? <laughs> And I was like, I'm pretty sure we, we, we know what we need to do. But she, but she was adamant, like, you need to have a mission statement. And I was like, but why? And she couldn't answer it, because she's like, every company has one. But I was like, because how we go about doing stuff, or whether it's creating a dish, or coming up with a new idea, I think it's incredibly inefficient. Um, it doesn't, it's not, it's not the way most people would go about doing it. We don't write, it, it doesn't follow a linear path. And... Um, I'm happy with that. Um, and basically, she couldn't understand that concept, that I'm happy with the, this crazy, windy line that we're following, because I think the end product is going to be superior than following this planned outline. And uh, it's a very organic, crazy process. So um, that's why we don't have a mission statement. I mean, I was just like, we just won't. We don't. So. You know, it was, you know, I don't know. So that's what I told her. She's like, well, everyone has to have a mission statement. I was like, but why? And she still didn't answer me. So that was it. Hi. Hi. Um, so you seem to take some pretty firm stances and have strong opinions. And I'm just wondering, in general, related to your industry or food, what you think is overrated and underrated? Um, in the restaurant business? I, I would start with our restaurants for sure. Um, I think what's underrated um, 
there are, there isn't actually enough going on, I think, in the American food culture to say that there's anything underrated right now. I think that overall, uh, going back to what we were talking about in the beginning of the conversation about figs, there isn't enough creativity. People are, it's sort of stagnant. We, we don't have people that are pushing the envelope. You have pockets here or there and with Wiley in, in, in um, New York and you know Chicago, the whole scene is sort of like that. But um, it's really, it doesn't have to always be that type of f food and I think that is underrated. Um, people may say it's stupid or you know, I just don't feel that it's, it's uh, properly understood and I don't think people understand. I almost consider it like high fashion. Like, they don't understand that it actually does trickle down and changes everything. Um, and right now, if you speak to most people, I think in general, um, like we're, America's still a steakhouse town, a hamburger town, um, and that's a problem. I'm not a problem, I just, I just don't think that there's anything uh, that's underrated. Uh, so, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I, I confused myself. <laughs> Hi. Given the importance that you put on creativity, how do you inspire that as a manager since you can't do it for all your restaurants from the kitchen anymore? <laughs> I am going through that process right now. <laughs> um, it's very difficult. Uh, managing people is, is one of the worst things in the world. <laughs> you know, I guess some people, but the thing is I don't think people are born with it. You just, something, you learn, you learn to deal with it. Um, and, and for a long time, I could work just on pure rage and anger. Um, and I, I literally could. I mean, I, I think Pete's, Pete's seen this, and I could, get a, I could work on, and just be in a, a, a fit of anger, and it would last all day. And I could just get so much done. It was like adrenaline. And uh, I could sort of, you know, get people to get, I could move people faster because out of, out of sheer fear. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe a little still, um, but it took a toll on my health, uh, stress for sure, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to find a better way in terms of in managing people. Because um, not everyone, I assume that everyone has the same goals. Um, maybe I should write a mission statement down, I don't know. <laughs> but. Um, I, I, I do assume that people have the same goals and you know recently with the Midtown project that we're working on, I was just like, why, why are we just meeting expectations? Why don't we, why, why aren't our, why, why don't we just, why are we just meeting expectations? And it really made me upset. And then I, I, I've, um, I'm going through this process right now. So I'm trying to figure it out, how to, manage people and to have them be inspired to sort of exceed expectations um, from a distance. I feel like I'd be able to be, uh, I'd be, be able to be more effective with that message if I was uh, at Midtown, but I'm not, I'm here. Um, and I'm not gonna be in Midtown that much this year at all because of the growing business and different ventures going on. So. I got to learn quickly how to manage people at a distance. So. Hi. Um, as a longtime New Yorker and had recently moved out here, I, I've sort of found that the Silicon Valley, the South Bay, is actually sort of bland for food. How do we, as as sort of customers and consumers, make or help good food to happen? Um, I think uh, this is again a question that was a great question that was brought up yesterday. Um, I disagreed with the panel. I didn't voice my opinion. I think that a lot of it has to depend on the cooks, the chefs. We're the middlemen. We're the middlemen between the purveyors and the farmers, and to the customer. And um, we have to take the chance. Chefs have to take the chance. Restaurateurs have to take the chance um, to open up restaurants that you know, will challenge your palate, that will please your palate, that will, at the end of the day, be a, you know, a good restaurant. Um, but a lot of that, but, you know, you got to meet us sort of halfway. 
a little bit. Um, because, you know, they brought up a good example of this restaurant called Win uh, Winterland. And uh, it failed, but a lot of it, uh, the reason it failed, I'm sure there was, the biggest reason was uh, lack of support from um, the, the neighborhood. Again, they didn't want to support something that was going to be drastically different than, they didn't want it, it didn't fit the San Francisco mold. So, um, I think that, I don't know. I don't know, I don't have that answer. But I do know if you find, you read, if you, you read the local newspaper and they were reviewing some spot and some young kid is, is doing something crazy or, or sounds wacky, go support him. Because uh, trust me, you're not making much money in this business. And um, to, to take that leap of faith and to open up a place that is, is unconventional, you know, that's the best thing you can do is support them. So, and be patient. Because we're, we're the perfect example of making really bad food and learning how to, how to make it somewhat tasty now, so. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll end it up with um, one final question. So. What's what's on the what's on the plate when you cook for yourself when you're you know eating at home or outside the restaurant? Um, in my refrigerator right now, I have some beer and a bottle of champagne, <laughs> and, and that will I will never drink because I just won't. won't. I, don't, I never cook for myself. Uh, I don't even have plateware. I have nothing. Um, because usually I order delivery. It's the one of the, <laughs> you know, it's one of the few few pleasures of living in New York is that you can get almost anything you want delivered, um, and you know the meal that I want to have, the meal that I eat the most, um, and I consider restaurants my home, is staff meal, and it's the most important meal of the day. And it's something that I witnessed here today. It's really cool that you guys have these cafeterias. I don't, I don't think how, uh, maybe you guys do fathom how important it is that you guys have, you know, an amazing F and B program here. And staff meal is the most important meal of the day. And I tell my cooks that if you're not going to spend time and love and passion uh, trying to make something delicious for your peers, for your you know, for the servers and the guy next to you, how are you going to care about a paying customer? Um, so that's why staff meal to me is the ultimate judge of like how a restaurant's doing. So um, for me, uh, even though I don't cook at home, like, that's that's what I eat usually. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. Cool. Thank you very much, guys.